Uh, good afternoon and welcome back to Grand Rounds. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium and also please remember to fill out the program evaluations and if you could give us uh, any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers, we would appreciate that. Today I have the uh, pleasure of introducing Dr. Marlon Hansen. Uh, Dr. Hansen is a professor in, in the departments of both otolaryngology and neurosurgery at the University of Iowa. Uh, he sits on the uh, editorial review boards of several peer-reviewed journals. He uh, also has been very, very extensively published uh, in uh, uh, liter the uh, literature, particularly in regards to uh, ENT surgery and hearing loss, and uh, the CMU committee is quite pleased that he was able to join us here today to update us on hearing loss evaluation and treatment. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hansen. Thanks. Oh, yeah, the mic's working. So it, uh, it's great to be here, and uh, hopefully, please make it interactive. Raise your hand. Uh, you know, jump up and down if you have questions during the middle of it. We don't have to just go through this slide by slide. Um, but uh, again, I, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, maybe I thought to just start, I'd just kind of remind you what we're dealing with here. Um, the inner ear, uh, well, we... You're all familiar with the external ear, ear canal, tympanic membrane lined with skin, can have skin diseases, and then uh, the sound strikes the eardrum and then is transmitted through three small bones known as the ossicles, which then uh, move the fluid in the inner ear. The inner ear is actually comprised of six sensory organs. Um, there's five that have to do with vestibular senses, and then one that has to do with, with perception of sound, which is the, uh, the cochlea, and it's curled up like a snail. So today we'll just focus on the cochlea and exclude uh, all of the vestibular organs. Um, it, it's interesting to see that actually the stapes foot plate, which is what transmits the sound into the inner ear, doesn't actually interact directly uh, with, the with the cochlear fluids, but with the fluid that's in the vestibule all the vestibular system, but that gets transmitted into the cochlea. Um, one of the problems that the ear faces is this, uh, the fact that sound has very, very, very low energy. So sound is just movement of air molecules. It's a very low energy system compared to the visual system where you have photons, which are high energy sort of uh, things that you're detecting. With sound, you're detecting very small um, uh, energy movement of air molecules. And yet you have to somehow get that energy able to move water molecules because it's the water, the fluids in the inner ear that, that have to move and vibrate in order to detect the sound. And so the middle ear is sort of the mechanism that does that and we call it impedance matching. So there's an impedance mismatch between air and water. When sound comes from air and strikes water, it's effectively ex extremely dampened. And somehow you have to overcome that dampening, that impedance of the water to be able to move those water molecules. And uh, perhaps, I, at least when I talk to residents and to medical students, they feel like the, what, or what they're taught predominantly is a middle ear, uh, the ossicles, the bones in the middle ear work as a lever to amplify sound. And that's actually a very small component. It does help. So the lever mechanism of the middle ear does help in overcoming that, and if you lose that lever mechanism, you have a slight reduction in how much the sound is going to be amplified. But we can do prostheses and things that don't um, take advantage of the lever mechanism, and yet they work quite effectively. The real um, significant way that the ear overcomes impedance mismatch is that there's a an area difference in the size of the eardrum compared to the oval window where the sound's gonna be transmitted. So you can think of this, this eardrum as a big collector of sounds and then, it foc and then the, the hearing bones focus it down into the area of the foot plate. And there's a 18 to one uh, ratio difference in the area of the eardrum to the foot plate where it's focusing. So that's like taking um, a woman, say a 98 pound little petite woman in high heeled shoes, if she stepped on you, that would generate much more pressure for the amount of force, for the amount of weight that she has compared to if you had a 250 pound man step on you in his steel toe boots, but that weight gets distributed over a large area. And so it's, it's the same concept of a nail, right? You focus the, 
you take a point and then you're able to focus your energy into a very small area and then you're able to do that. And so that's that idea of, of having a large area of the tympanic membrane that collects sounds and then focuses into the foot plate is, is important for the function of the middle ear in overcoming this impedance mismatch. One other thing to just remind you that I suspect most of you are familiar with is that the cochlea, the inner ear, uh, the basilar membrane is sort of the sensory organ where the, where the sensory cells, the hair cells, sit on this organ or on this tissue. And it has mechanical properties such that when sound comes into the ear, high frequency sounds uh, best vibrate the base of the cochlea, which is kind of narrow and stiff, and low frequency sounds best vibrate the apex or the top of the cochlea where the membrane is kind of uh, wide and floppy. And so you get this idea of this traveling wave. In fact, the, the, the only Nobel Prize awarded in auditory neuroscience has been for von Bekesey's work and this idea that, that when sound comes in, you get this, this envelope of sound and if it's a low frequency sound, it gets shifted towards the apex. So this would represent the movement of the basilar membrane to a 250 hertz tone. And as you get higher and higher pitch sounds, that gets closer and closer to the base. And so you have what's called a tonotopic map of the cochlea. That's how one of the ways that your ear sorts out what frequencies of sound you're, you're hearing is where along this basilar membrane do the cells get activated. Um, and so this is sort of, again, depicting that. If you have a uh, 200 hertz sound, it's going to be shifted towards the apex, and you get into, you know, 8 kilohertz sound or something like that, and it'll be shifted towards the base. One of the things that happened when um, they first did this work, when Von Bekesey did this work, he did it in, in dead cats. Um, and um, the, he got at this broad envelope that wasn't, didn't have as much sensitivity as what they knew our hearing was psychoacoustically and was broad, more broadly tuned than what our hearing is. So there was this concept generated that somehow within the cochlea there had to be something else happening, an amplifier within the cochlea to um, further refine and amplify the sound that's coming in. And it got, kn it got known as a cochlear amplifier. So again, in a, in a, uh, the, in a dead animal, you would notice that you have this very broadly tuned um, sort of envelope with a traveling wave over the sound. But then when they repeated it in a live animal, you get a much sharper um, sound, a much sharper tuning of that curve, and, a, and it's amplified considerably. And so this was known as a cochlear amplifier. For a long time, no one understood what it was, what was happening in the ear that was allowing for this extra, this extra activity or extra energy to be put into the system and was also tuning things. And it wasn't until a few decades ago that they found that outer hair cells have this capacity that when they're depolarized, somewhat like a muscle cell, different, um, different biomechanic way that they do it, but just like a muscle cell when it's depolarized will expand and contract an outer hair cell can do the same thing. And once that was discovered, then they were able to sort of understand that when you put sound into an ear and you activate the outer hair cells, they will capture that energy and then um, amplify it. And that can be sent back out to the system. So you have sound coming in and that sound gets amplified by the outer hair cells and can be transmitted back out through the tympanic membrane is now working as a speaker. And so you have this otoacoustic emissions. The sound is emit or the ear is emitting a sound in response to the sound that you put into it. And that's otoacoustic emissions. And that's the clinical test that's used every day in newborn nurseries um, to test to see whether newborns quote unquote hear. It's important to understand that otoacoustic emissions don't tell you that they hear, they tell you that the outer hair cells are working. So just to sort of convince you that, that outer hair cells have this uh, electromotility function, this is a video, and what's happened in this video is someone's put a pipette on the cell to um, 
change its membrane potential and they sync it with sound. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. So you Five, see this six, uh, eight eight rock. outer membrane of the hair cell sort of having this motility. Um, and it's that, that function of the outer hair cells is what a autoacoustic emission test is testing to see if this is occurring in response to sound. Now you believe me. <laughs> okay, so, and we'll come back to autoacoustic emissions in just a minute. So, someone comes in, complains of hearing loss, uh, and there's a lot of different things that could happen. A lot of history you need to know. Is it sudden? Is it gradual? Is it one ear? Is it both ears? What's the associated things? All the typical things that you would do for, for any sort of uh, history of a medical illness. Um, just to remind you that tuning forks can be very helpful, especially for people with a sudden hearing loss. I strongly encourage you to try and do it. The one thing I'll say about tuning forks is the one that you got kind of when you were a brand new medical student and they were giving you your white coat and your reflex hammer and all those things, they probably had you get a tuning fork, which is 200 or 128 hertz. That's not a tuning fork for hearing. That's something you can use to test proprioception. And if you test it, that's what the patient's going to do is mostly get proprioception. You can hear it, but it's not a very good functional test that we use for these type of, of real tuning fork tests. The ideal one would be a 512 hertz uh, tuning fork, uh, 256 would be okay, but if you go down to 128 hertz, it's not very good. Um, so there's two tests that are typically done. The Weber test is where you put the tuning fork in the middle of the head somewhere. If they're really ha hard of hearing, you can put it on their teeth, on their incisors, you can put it on their nose bridge, just anywhere in the head, and you ask them, this is what you do when someone has better hearing in one ear than the other, and you're trying to sort out is it a conductive loss in that ear or is it a sensory neural loss? If they say, I don't hear very well in my right ear, and you put the tuning fork in the middle of their head and they hear it in the right ear, that implies they have a conductive hearing loss in the right ear. If they say, I don't hear very well in the right ear, and you put the tuning fork in the middle of the head and they hear it in the left ear, that would imply they have a sensory neural hearing loss. And then the Rene Rene test um, can, can sort of confirm those things. It's where you're testing the function of bone conduction versus air conduction. So you put the tuning fork on the mastoid portion back here, and, and then you put it in front of the ear and you ask them whether it's louder behind or in front. And if it's louder on the bone, then that implies that the inner ear is working normally, but the conduction mechanism isn't, so it would imply a conductive hearing loss. And if they hear it louder in front of the ear as opposed to on the bone, that implies the conduction mechanism is normal the, the middle ear is working, and so they should hear it better in front, and that would imply they have a sensory neural hearing loss. Um, but tuning forks are, are even in the best of hands. Someone, um, you know, I, I see lots of patients every week who have hearing loss, and even in my hands, they're not exquisitely helpful. Um, they are helpful in certain things, but I don't make diagnoses just off tuning fork exam. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of, if someone has a hearing loss, get a hearing test. I mean, you, you know, you, if someone had other things, you'd test it. And so just get a hearing test. It'll save you lots and lots and lots of trouble. Um, and hearing tests are actually a battery of tests. It's not one specific test that they do. And they're all subjective. They all require that the patient is, um, has a mental capacity that they can respond and understand what they're being asked to do and that they have a willingness to participate. So if you get someone who was assaulted and they are suing someone or it's a police officer who's trying to get workman's comp and they're claiming that they have a hearing loss in one ear, if they're not willing to participate in that, they can fake or they can not respond to the sound in their ear and they could be giving you a false report on a hearing test. So that requires that they're honest and that they're able to do the test. And we do pure tone audiometry. That means specific tones like a 200 hertz, a 250 hertz tone, a 500 hertz tone, a 1,000 hertz tone, a 3,000 hertz tone, whatever. You give a, a very a tone, and they do it two ways. They either do it by putting um, an insert or a headphone over the ear, so you're going through the ear canal and through the eardrum, and that's air conduction. And then they also test 
how it does on bone. So they'll put an oscillator back on the bone and send the, send the sound in through the bone so that you're bypassing the middle ear and you're testing bone conduction. It's also important to, to look at how they're doing with speech. So they do what's called a speech reception threshold um, and then a speech discrimination score. And I'll get into that in just a minute. So again, pure tones presented at different intensities. So they do a 250 hertz tone and then they see how soft the sound can be. Oh, yes, please. Yes, so the question is, for every, if in case people didn't hear, as I understand the question, I'll repeat it. Um, if someone is malingering, can you use some of these objective tests to verify, so like an autoacoustic emissions? And the answer is yes, that's a great use of them. There's actually ways that, if they're faking it in one ear, there's audiological techniques that a good audiologist can actually ferret it out. Um, there's psychoacoustical things that they can do. It's called the Stenger's test that they can actually ferret it out. But even so, it's nice to confirm it with an objective test. And in that case, autoacoustic emissions, and I'll talk about later, even better, an auditory brainstem response, or ABR, will tell you whether or not their ear responds to sound. Um, so yeah, that's a good. So again, the, the, the threshold is determined by where that patient can first, can get just detect the sound 50% of the time they're responding, yeah, I hear it, yeah, I hear it. That's their threshold of hearing. And it's calibrated to what normal young adults hear. So everybody's hearing loss is presented, or hearing level, it's presented sort of flat according to a normalized population. Our hearing is not flat. We hear certain sounds better than others, but it looks flat on the hearing test because it's normalized. This is just some examples of common intensities of sound in terms of hearing levels. So, um, you know, a whisper would be about 20 decibels. So anywhere between zero to 20 is considered normal hearing. Most people speak at about 60. Um, remember, it's a logarithmic scale. So things can get quite, the intensity of sound goes up tremendously as you go into higher things. So 100 decibel sound is, uh, 10 orders of magnitude louder than the zero decibel sound. Um, and so again, how do you read an audiogram? This is the intensity of the sound going down this way or loudness. This is the frequency of sound going across this way. And this is testing in both ears. So in, in this instance, both the right, which is the red, and the left, which is the blue ears, the patient could hear the sound at 25 decibels at 250 hertz. And then at 4,000 hertz, in the left ear, they heard it at 40, and in the right ear at 45. Um, and we'll skip that. So, um, so normal hearing is considered anything less than 25 decibels. So we give them a range of zero to 25 to be considered normal hearing. So in this person, both ears have normal hearings up to about 2,000 hertz, and then as they get into the high frequencies, they start to lose a little bit of hearing. That's typical of someone with presbycusis. Speech frequencies are usually around somewhere between 500 and 3,000. So the critical, critical areas for hearing are 500 to 3,000. Um, so then, in addition to doing the sound through the ear canals, they also will test it by putting, the, putting it through the bone. And that's important because the bone directly tests the inner ear function. It bypasses, you could have, you could have your ear, you could be born without an ear canal. And as long as your inner ear is normal, you'll hear normally through bone conduction. So the important thing to remember is bone conduction tells you what the inner ear function is. And air conduction tells you what the overall system is doing. So if someone has a difference between their bone conduction and their air conduction, what's called an air bone gap, that tells you that the middle ear or the eardrum or the ear canal is not working. And that tells you there's a conductive hearing loss. So air bone gap is a conductive hearing loss because there's a difference between what the inner ear is capable of doing and what, how the ear is actually functioning when you put sound in through the ear canal. 
Um, so now we'll talk about the speech uh, scores. So um, there's, uh, you'll see this commonly in the hearing test, pure tone average, which is just an average of these frequencies across here, a speech reception threshold, um, which is where they can first start to understand speech. So that's more critical than pure tones. So pure tones tell you where they hear specific tones, but no one really cares where they hear a thousand hertz tone. They care where they hear someone's voice. And that's what the speech reception threshold tells you, is the same thing as you get for a pure tone, except it's speech that's being delivered, not, um, not a specific tone. And so this, this, is, this, should be, this should actually be very close, the speech reception threshold should very closely kind of mimic the average of the frequencies across the speech spectrum. So if you look at the average across here, the speech reception threshold will be very close to that or something's fishy is going on. Um, and then there's this probably the most critical thing that happens and people don't pay much attention to it is the word recognition score. So to get the word recognition score, what they do is they look at a patient's um, speech reception threshold and they say, okay, they can hear speech at 40 decibels. And then they'll turn up the sound 40 decibels more than that, so 80 decibels. And then they ask them to repeat the words that are being spoken. So they'll say, you will say ball. And if they say ball, they get it right. And if they say wall or fall or small or doll, they miss it. And you will say um, sidewalk. And if they say sidewalk, they get it. And if they say something else, they miss it. And so you're asking that when sounds are loud enough that they can hear them, how well does their ear discriminate? And that's the main problem that people have with sensory neural hearing loss is not just that they can't hear sounds, it's that they can't discriminate sounds. And so speech recognition or speech understanding or word recognition scores is perhaps the most critical measure of inner ear function that we have. So these are just some examples and um, you can kind of look at them and I'll describe them and in your own mind you can kind of figure out what might be going on. So in this patient, um, this is air conduction in the left ear of these X's. So you can look at that and say, does he have normal hearing or not normal hearing in the left ear? And you can see that everything's less than 20 decibels in the left ear. So you'd say that's normal hearing in the left ear. Okay. Then you look at the right ear and you look at air conduction. That's how they actually hear. Unless they're wearing a bone conduction hearing aid, air conduction is how we all hear. So air conduction in the right ear um, is in these open circles in the red. So this patient has a high frequency hearing loss, right, in the right ear. And then you say, is that hearing loss due to inner ear or middle ear? And so now you want to look at the bone curve and say, where does the bone line, where's the inner ear function? So you look in here, and this is the bone curve for the right ear. And you can say, well, the inner, the right ear has a loss of inner ear function. So then you look and see if this matches up. The right ear's about 30 decibels, which would be about the average of this over here. So the SRT seems about right. And then you notice that their ability to discriminate words is poorer in the right ear than the left ear. So all of that put together would suggest that he has a sensory neural hearing loss in the right ear, right? Because the bone curve is down and the speech discrimination score is distorted. So here's a different example. Again, look at the left ear. You have the X's, which are the air conduction in the left ear. And you can say that's normal hearing in the left ear. You don't even need to do bone conduction because they hear normally. Then you look in the right ear and you can see that there's a moderate hearing loss across all frequencies. This is air conduction in the right ear. And so then you say, well, what's the inner ear function? And in this case, the bone curve is up here within the range of normal. So the right inner ear is normal, but the hearing is abnormal. So that implies an air bone gap. So this is what an air bone gap looks like. So what kind of hearing loss would that be? A conductive hearing loss, right? So this is a right conductive hearing loss. And then maybe one more to go through. Um, so this could be a patient with a hole in the eardrum, with an acicular disruption, otosclerosis, or something like that. So here's another hearing test. This is a right ear air conduction, 
And you can see that in the right ear, there's a moderate hearing loss, and in the left ear, air conduction, there's a more severe hearing loss. So both ears have a hearing loss. The hearing in the left is worse than the hearing in the right. And then you look at bone conduction, and they both are the same. So bone conduction in the right ear is at about 45, 40, 50, and air conduction in the left ear is about 40, 50. So the right ear has no air bone gap, has a sensory neural hearing loss, and the left ear has a conductive hearing loss and a sensory neural hearing loss, right? because the, the inner ear is not quite normal. So this would be a right sensory nerve hearing loss and the left mixed hearing loss. So this could be someone with presbycusis that has a hole in the left eardrum would be an example of how you might get something like that. Does that make sense? Okay. So back to this otoacoustic emissions. Again, this is a measure. It's, it's very rapid. You can just do it in a newborn nursery. You have a, the child doesn't have to be sedated. You can do it in your clinic. It can be done in, in an audiologist clinic with, an, with regular patients. And again, it's testing this outer hair cell function. So you put a probe in the ear that delivers a sound, and then you have a very sensitive microphone that detects the sound that's coming back out that's generated by the outer hair cells. And um, if, if that's not working, either there's something wrong with the sound going in and coming out, a conductive hearing loss or something, or there's a problem with the outer hair cells. It doesn't tell you that they hear. It only tells you that up to the outer hair cells it's working. But in the vast, vast majority of cases, if the outer hair cells are working, then the rest of the system is going to work as well. But it is possible to have a newborn who passes a newborn hearing screen and yet doesn't hear. If they're born without an auditory nerve or some other things, we call that auditory neuropathy. So if a if they pass their newborn hearing screening, but they're not reaching their milestones, developmental speech milestones and things like that, or the parents have concerns, it bears repeating it or getting a different type of test to confirm it because this only tests the system up to a point. But it's a really easy way to do a test. I mean, it's done because it's so well, and it'll get 99% of the cases anyway. This is kind of the report. You don't really need to look at that. So the other thing you can do, which is an objective test, is called auditory brainstem response, uh, ABR, or some places they call it BEAR. And this is where they put EEG-like electrodes across the scalp, and then you deliver a sound to the ear, and then the computer, you deliver it many times, thousand times, pop, 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 deliver the sound, and you get a lot of activity. You get EMG activity, you get cortical activity, but if you average it over 1,000, you can average out all the responses that are not synchronized to the sound, and then you get a series of uh, potentials that represent the response of the auditory nerve and the lower brainstem to the sound that you're putting in by averaging across multiple, multiple suites. And it sort of looks like this. So you get these, uh, this was, if a click's put in there, this is a tone or a hertz put in, you get better responses. The, the broader the sound, so a click gives you a better response. And you get these series of peaks and waves that sort of detect this would be early auditory nerve activity, and then this is just in the cochlear nucleus of the brainstem, and then as it moves up, probably into lower brainstem auditory pathways, and you're seeing those responses. And so in this test, you actually see the response of the auditory nerve in the lower brainstem. So this is actually a better test uh, for hearing than the autoacoustic emissions and it's an objective test. But this does require a child to be sedated, um, and it takes a lot longer, so it's a more complicated sort of test. But you can get a threshold. You can see that as they monitor these responses, this wave five by 10 decibels, it, it, all, it goes away by five decibels. You get a little bit of peak, so then you get a threshold response um, to say about what their hearing level is. The peak, wave one here, that is early auditory nerve. So that's probably the, the most distal part of the auditory nerve as it responds. This wave two, which is uh, here, is probably distal auditory nerve close to the brainstem nuclei. This is probably cochlear nucleus. They're just surface, like EEG electrodes. Oh, it's um, I, s several centimeters. It's a long ways, right? Yeah, 
it's actually a series of electrodes. So they have them on the mastoid on the other side. They have some reference electrodes on the vertex in here. So it's quite a ways away. That's why you have to deliver it over so many times, and the computer has to average the response. The other use for this test is, um, uh, for instance, pay people who have uh, mental retardation or other things, and it's also can be used to screen for retrochochlear pathology. If you're concerned that someone may have an acoustic neuroma, they'll actually have a delay in, their, in these wave responses if there's a tumor pressing on the auditory nerve. It's a fairly sensitive technique. The second most sensitive technique for acoustic neuromas is an ABR. The most sensitive is an MRI, but an ABR is better than a CAT scan for detecting um, acoustic neuromas. Um, the other thing that can be done is to look at middle ear function. So there's uh, this uh, tympanometry. So this, um, you put a plug in the ear, you deliver, um, or you, you vary air pressure, and then you deliver a sound, and you look at how um, well that sound is sort of emitted off of the eardrum. And it gives you a sense of the compliance of the eardrum. And this is something that pediatricians often have in their offices to kind of confirm their otos otoscopic views. Um, and you get this sort of, this is the readout that you get. It. So here's the, the variation of um, ear pressure in the ear canal, and then this is the acoustic emittance, or you can think of this as the compliance of the eardrum. In a normal, in a normal patient, um, you should, the eardrum should be most compliant when the ear pressure is the same on the outside of the ear as on the, and the ear canal is behind the eardrum. So you should have the most compliance when there's in a normal situation at zero. And then as you increase the pressure in the ear canal, that forces the eardrum in and it becomes less compliant. And as you uh, reduce the pressure in the ear canal, it pulls the eardrum out and it becomes less compliant. So in a normal situation, you should have a peak at about zero um, uh, Pascal of pressure. If someone has a fluid behind their eardrum, then they don't get any compliance. The eardrum is stiff. It doesn't move. So you get this flat. So this is the typical thing, and this is how you distinguish. It helps a pediatrician to distinguish uh, fluid behind the eardrum and confirm what they're seeing. So these are actually fairly easy tests that there's handheld devices you can do in your own office. Um, and then this would imply, if you get sort of a peak down here, it would imply negative middle ear pressure. So someone who has some eustachian tube dysfunction, there's no fluid behind the eardrum, but their eardrum is retracted, and as you reduce the pressure in the ear canal, that pulls the eardrum back out into its natural position, and then you start to see the peak. So that's tympanometry. Um, so what are some other clues to conductive hearing loss? Conductive hearing loss, because they hear their own sounds inside their head, very well, they actually can modulate their voice. So people with conductive hearing loss hear their own voice quite well. In fact, they hear it better than normal. If you guys plug your ear canals, you can hear your voice well, and it may even sound a little bit loud to you, and so you may speak softly if you have a conductive hearing loss. And, but you'll modulate your voice. You'll know if you're being too loud or too soft or whatever. Um, and People with conductive hearing loss, hearing aids work great for conductive hearing loss because all you need is extra energy in the system. If the energy gets into the ear, the ear can interpret it, it can discriminate it, it can understand it, and they just need louder sounds. Um, so common causes of conductive hearing loss, um, you know, serous effusions, chronic otitis media with perforations or acicular erosions, cholesteatoma, otosclerosis, um, and then trauma would be common things. Otosclerosis may be a new concept for you. It's actually quite common. Um, and these are uh, people who sort of in their 20s to 40s, sometimes a little older in life, develop this very slowly gradual onset of hearing loss. It runs in families, and it's due to this sort of um, abnormal bone formation around the stapes foot plate. So you can, this is a histopathological slide showing that right at the front edge of that stapes foot plate, you get this bony remodeling. So this is the stapes here. This would be the cochlea. This is where the sound would come in, and that stapes gets fixed. It's typically in both ears, but sometimes just in one ear. It's a gradual, progressive sort of thing, and it's a very easy disease, especially early on, to treat. Um, so they can wear a hearing aid 
hearing aids, again, work very well for conductive hearing losses. Or there's a surgical procedure where we can remove this uh, fixed bone and replace it with a prosthesis that's known as a stapedectomy, and that works very well. 95% of the time, they're going to have back to near normal hearing in the ear. Um, there is a risk of hearing loss with a stapedectomy, but it's quite low. So um, sensory neural hearing loss is very common. It's probably the, by far and away the most common sensory deficit that we have. And I think the thing that um, people generally fail to recognize is how much difficulty it causes for the patient and their families. They, it just becomes, a social, socially it becomes very difficult um, and emotionally, not only for them, but for family members. Um, presbycusis is, of course, the most common. You can think of it as sort of a genetically determined uh, progressive hearing loss that typically will affect the higher frequencies more than the lows. So you see this sort of classic pattern where you have pretty good low frequency hearing and then it's symmetric, affects both ears the same, both ears have the same genetics, both ears have the same age. So hearing should be symmetric, hearing loss. And it's this down sloping. And it, how they do on speech discrimination scores is variable. Some people do quite well and some people don't. And that really has an impact on how well they're going to do with hearing aids. If they have poor discrimination scores, they're not going to be good hearing aid users. Uh, Noise-induced hearing loss um, is, was very common uh, early in the Industrial Revolution. Then OSHA standards came in and it's been mitigated somewhat. But OSHA standards don't apply to farmers in Iowa or other people, you know, independent contractors that are doing construction work or something like that. And it, they certainly don't apply to iPod users, which is we're really concerned that there's a rising generation that's going to have quite a bit of hearing loss because the noise exposure you get when you're 20 may not manifest until you're 45 or 60, but the damage could have been done in the 20s. Um, and it has a very classic recognizable pattern on a hearing test. So they always have this loss. No matter what the frequency of sound that they were exposed to, the damage is always most, um, most evident or, or greatest at 4,000 hertz. And so you see this notch. Remember, presbycusis, you see this sort of fall off, and then it, the higher the frequency, the worse the hearing. You don't get this recovery in the highest tones. But with noise-induced hearing loss, you get this notch at 4,000 hertz. It, it clearly begins to involve the higher frequencies but you have a notch to the pattern. And then it just progresses over time. And they, are, they have a lot of trouble with word recognition scores, people who have noise-induced hearing loss. Um, genetic, there's lots and lots of genetic causes. They can be syndromic, non-syndromic. There's at least 100 different uh, genetic causes. Um, and they can have uh, early onset congenital. They can have sort of progressive patterns that, that manifest in childhood, in adulthood, or other things. So it's hard to go through um, all the different causes for genetic hearing loss. Aminoglycosides, um, probably the thing I would drive home here is, for those of you that use genomycin, screening the hearing is not the best, is not, the hearing, the, the cochlea, the hair cells in the cochlea are much more resistant to genomycin than the vestibular hair cells. If you're giving someone systemic genomycin, there's a much higher risk of ablating their vestibular system than their cochlea. So most people sort of will ask and inquire and maybe even do OAEs to test to see how the hair cells are, the cochlear hair cells are handling up. But I see several patients a year who are vestibular cripples and yet have pretty good, even normal hearing after having systemic genomycin. So that's just one thing to remember is genomycin is much more toxic to the vestibular organs than it is to the auditory organs. In fact, we use that to treat Meniere's disease where we're trying to save their hearing but ablate one vestibular system. Um, the other one to be aware of where we sometimes see things get missed is a sudden sensory neural hearing loss. I would say 8 out of 10 patients who have a sudden sensory neural hearing loss um, something like this happened. They went to the, they noticed that they weren't hearing. Suddenly in one ear, they say, I can't hear in this ear. They go to the ER urgent care. They get looked at. They get told they have fluid behind their eardrum and they get put on antibiotics. And about a week later, they report to their general practitioner and they say, you know, I've, I have this fluid behind my eardrum. 
I was seen in the ER, they gave me this antibiotic, I still have a hearing loss, and they say, well, it must be resistant, so they give you a different antibiotic, and it's about a month before they ever get a hearing test. And, and the, the problem is, sudden sensory nerve hearing loss, if it's, to, if it's caught early, you can treat it, and treatment is about 60, 70% effective if you can give them steroids within that first week or even two. Um, but often, by the time we see it, it's been missed and it hasn't been treated other than with antibiotics. The treatment for it is steroids. Um, antivirals are often given but don't have a proven efficacy, but, but high-dose steroids are effective if they're given within the first couple of weeks. And sometimes we'll inject the steroids in addition to oral ones, or if they're diabetic, we can inject the steroids, and those also work well. About 1% of people who have asymmetric auditory function will have a vestibular schwannoma or retrochoclear lesion. So anyone with asymmetric auditory function, either asymmetric tinnitus, unilateral tinnitus only in one ear, or hearing loss, sensory nerve hearing loss only in one ear, should have some sort of workup, typically an MRI, to look for a retrochoclear lesion to see why they do it. It's, usually it'll come up negative, but the first symptom of all vestibular schwannomas, the vast majority of 70% of patients, their first symptom is unilateral tinnitus, and then their second symptom is hearing loss. They, do, they are not dizzy, even though it's off the vestibular nerve. Very few of them are dizzy until they get quite big. Um, and then maybe one other disease with sensory neuro hearing loss that's asymmetric that just to briefly highlight, Meniere's disease. Um, and hearing loss is always present. So if someone has vertigo, recurrent episodes of vertigo, and they don't have a unilateral hearing loss, they probably don't have Meniere's disease. They might have migraines or they might have something else going on. They probably don't have Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is way overdiagnosed. Um, so to diagnose Meniere's disease, you definitely need to have an audiogram that shows that they have a hearing loss. They have a very classic hearing loss. It's different than most. It's in the low frequencies and it fluctuates. So one day it's bad, the next day it's good. It sort of fluctuates over time. Um, and so you see this sort of pattern like this. In addition to that, in addition to the hearing loss, they'll have fullness, pressure, roaring in the ear, and these severe recurrent attacks of vertigo, and, um, and those become the dominant. The vertigo attacks are much, most of them will say, I'd easily give up my hearing if I could get rid of my vertigo attacks. Um, so then that sort of, will just quickly go into ways that we can treat. So this is, a, this is very common, right? I mean, I, my dad has uh, pretty bad hearing loss, and he's had three sets of hearing aids, and they all end up in the sock drawer. Um, and it's because of this problem, especially in noisy situations. A patient with sensory neuro hearing loss does fine one-on-one. -on -one. Their problem is when there's lots of people talking. They can't understand. And you put hearing aids on them, and the hearing aids amplify all the sounds. And so they're still left with this d dilemma of being able to understand what they want to hear. And technology's gotten a lot better. I'm not saying hearing aids aren't appropriate. They're a great treatment for mild and moderate cases of sensory neuro hearing loss and great treatments for conductive hearing loss. But even so, they're not perfect. They're hearing aids, not hearing cures, because often there's this dilemma of speech discrimination. And at some point, hearing aids become where they really can't do any good. You can, it's like having a radio that's out of tune and all the hearing aid is doing is cranking up the volume on the radio. You need tuning in the ear. And that's what the cochlear implant does. So cochlear implants are used for people who have severe to profound uh, sensory nerve hearing loss where they can't really get the benefit from the hearing aids. And it's a series of electrodes placed into the ear um, that then delivers the, the um, process sound via an electrical pulses to the auditory nerve in the ear. And I thought I'd just let you hear what that might sound like. So um, this is one of our areas of very active research is how we can increase the number of channels in a cochlear implant. So this is simulation of what it would sound like to a cochlear implant patient if they only had one channel. The first cochlear implant was single channel. So this is a, this is a sentence, and when you can understand it, raise your hand. Anyone get it? What did you get? What was it? Husband, okay. Eight channels. This is what typical cochlear implant users are between eight and 16 channels. The wife helped her husband. 
What was it? Okay, we'll see if you're right. The wife helped her husband. The wife helped her husband. Okay, so the wife helped her husband. And you can see, for speech, actually, the implant does quite well. People can be, perf I mean, you can have a child who's born profoundly deaf, and they have normal speech development and very close to normal speech understanding and quiet. But they don't do good in noise, and they don't good, do well with music. So here's, another, here's an example of 13 channels. No cochlear implant patient, I mean, 32 channels. No cochlear implant patient has 32 channels. But this would be music simulated through 32 channels. And this is what it should sound like. So there's a big discrepancy of how we're able to deliver and understand speech as compared to com more complex things like music or speech and background noise with a cochlear implant. Uh, one of the things that's happened, if, if this was a hearing test, um, one of the things that we've recently been working on, particularly at Iowa, but now it's actually FDA approved um, as of last year, is this concept of someone who still has this is the range of their hearing. So they have no hearing in these high frequencies, and yet they have some preservable, useful, low-frequency hearing. And the idea is to do hybrids, just like a hybrid vehicle is sort of gas and electric. So we do acoustic and electric. So we use a small electrode to fill in for these high frequencies, and then they wear a hearing aid for the low frequencies. So they're using both acoustic and electrical and a cochlear implant in the same ear. And they do really well. These are the best of the best cochlear implant users. Um, so I thought to, to close, we'd just do one quick case presentation and have you guys think about it a little bit. So this is a 40-year-old police officer, and he was hit on the right side. This, was, this is an actual case I had. So he was hit on the right side of his head when he was trying to arrest someone. And uh, he complains of hearing loss in that ear. And he, on exam... His, his eardrum looks normal. He doesn't, if you, if you put the Weber in, he goes to the left ear, and he can't hear anything no matter how you put it on the right ear, whether it's bone or the air. And this is his hearing test. So in his left ear, he has normal hearing. This is where he's telling you, you he hears in the right ear. And then bone conduction, they can't do it any louder than 60 decibels. It starts to transfer to the other sound. So this is responding as like it's a dead ear. His word recognition score, his pure tone average, though, is, is, would be a 90. But, he, but he's starting to say he can hear speech at 55. And actually, if you give words to that ear, he, respond, he gets 68% of them right. So... This is a bit of a red flag. It's a red flag for several reasons. They should always be able to hear the tuning fork no matter where you put it on their head, right? If you put it on this side, it's the same as putting it in the middle. He should have, if his right ear were dead, he'd still hear it in the left ear, right? Even if you put it here. If the sound doesn't matter where you put it on the skull. So that's a red flag that when you put the tuning fork by the ear that he doesn't respond, he's just not responding at all. He's also given you these really elevated thresholds, but his SRT is quite low. There's no way that he could under, pick up speech and understand 68% of the words if his, his hearing was this profound of a loss. So it's kind of a red flag that, that he ha, may have some, some gain issues and looking for disability or things like that. So what might you do in this case? And we sort of highlighted it by the question before. Yeah, so look for some evoked responses. So otoacoustic emissions was actually present in both ears. So if we put the probe in his ear and looked to see if things were working, it was, it was do it. And then when we did a, a brainstem response, he had responses down to normal hearing levels. So we knew at that point that he was feigning a hearing loss and that it was functional. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful to you, and thank you very much. If you have questions, I'm happy to take them.
Yes. What does the audiometry, what does the speech of the examiner uh, enter in? How, how does that enter in? So if, if they're doing speech scores yes. and, it, and it's the, what about the, the audiologist who's delivering it? Right. Yeah, so there's two ways. Um, they, they have taped, they have taped word lists that they can use. So they can use a tape list or they can use their own voice where they say it. And, and so as long as they're a native English speaker, either one of those is fine. Actually, patients do better with live voice than taped voice. But, but if it's a non-native English speaker, so if, if they're doing their live voice, it still goes through an audiometer that controls the intensity or the loudness of the word that's being given to them. So it makes no difference if it's male or female? It, it, it probably does a little bit um, um, because if they have a high, high, high frequency hearing loss, they're going to do better with male voices. Right. The tape voices are generally male. Um, but, but people tend to do better with live voice than they do with tape voice. Um, so it, it, minor differences, I, it's not, doesn't come into the equation, doesn't make a huge difference. Yes. What's actually going on with tinnitus and why is it episodic? Um, it, it can be episodic and sometimes it isn't. It tends to be, we don't know what causes tinnitus. Um, Almost everybody who has tinnitus has damage to their auditory system, um, but not everybody. But most people, um, the classic would be someone with a high-frequency hearing loss, and they get a high-pitched tinnitus. Um, and we don't know why that is. Perhaps one way that I explain it to patients, although we don't know that this is actually true or not, is it's sort of like a phantom pain. If you cut off your finger, you know, the nerve's not connected to the to the nerve endings to the receptor cells any longer and so the brain kind of fills in these sensations that that are sort of phantom and so and that's essentially what um, tinnitus is is sort of a, a sound that is perceived by the brain that's not generated somewhere else and it typically occurs when there's damage to the inner ear and so you can imagine at least for a patient it's easy to understand that their brain is kind of filling in where their ear is not being active and in fact, if you um, have sound, one of the most reliable treatments for tinnitus is just sound. So they have white noise generators or fans at night and things, because when their tinnitus is worse is usually when it's quiet. So that's one of the reasons it might fluctuate is because the external noise is fluctuating or tinnitus can just fluctuate anyway, just like pain or any other perception can, can fluctuate. Um, the other thing I would say about tinnitus is, interestingly, cochlear implants are very effective in suppressing tinnitus. Not in everybody, but in most people. And again, you're reactivating that nerve. You're re-stimulating a nerve that hasn't been stimulated for lack of input from the hair cells. And so a cochlear implant reliably in 70, 75% of patients will suppress tinnitus. So yeah, it's, it's difficult. We, it's, it's a challenge. Yes. What is the military doing now to prevent hearing loss from uh, gunfire and various? Actually, that's that's a great question. Um, so w I actually have a grant from the Department of Defense to do these hybrid cochlear implants in patients who, um, in military people, um, to see how well they do with it. And we're having trouble recruiting because we had an age limit. And the new people in the military don't have near as much hearing loss, even those who are in Iraq and Afghanistan don't have near as much hearing loss as the World War II guys. Um, so they have, um, it's not always the case. The problem in the military is it's unpredictable when the noise, you know, you're walking along and all of a sudden the IED goes off. But if it's a predictable thing, you know you're gonna go into a combat zone. They, they have ear protection and things they do. And there's actually very, very active research in the military. We also have a basic, I'm a collaborator on a basic science grant looking at ways to reverse uh, the damage done by noise. And um, there are clinical trials underway to give antioxidants and some other drugs that are speculated to be uh, auditory protective uh, for people who they anticipate will be exposed to loud noises. So, they're doing things, they're looking especially for drugs that can rescue, not just prevent. 
because again, it's hard to predict. You know, you say, well, take your pill and then go shoot shoot someone. That might be difficult because uh, combat's sporadic, right? But if you had something that where they were exposed to the noise and then you could give it to them and rescue or regenerate, then that would be better. Um, so th there's actually a lot of, quite a bit of funding available through the military. They're working on it, but they don't have a, a perfect solution yet. Okay, thank you very much.